Oh, thank you. Is this working? Can you hear me? You can hear me, but it's not working. Well, can you hear me if I just yell? Yeah. Okay, great. So, um, welcome to this. Uh, my name is Dean Pritchard. I'm the director of the Baroque Ensemble and teach music history here at the Colton Conservatory. And I'm absolutely thrilled to be able to welcome to the Naming Concert John Butt um, here for this uh, wonderful event, which I think is going to be a lecture recital, so lecturing and recitaling at the beginning, and then a Q&A period afterwards. Okay, thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a great uh, uh, pleasure to be here, particularly in this wonderful uh, building, uh, which, which is certainly new to me. So uh, thank you for having us here. Uh, I'm going to be talking essentially about historically informed performance, um, what it is or what it can be. Uh, it's not necessarily one thing or the other. Um, what does it actually do? Um, is it worth doing what it does? Uh, can all musicians learn from something of the historical way of thinking about performance? Or uh, is it a negative? Does it suggest that we've sort of run out of our own ideas and have to go and look at the past to find out how to play music again? So there are several uh, questions either way that can be made all along here. Uh, unfortunately, we have a Dunedin consort to help to give you some live examples of some of the things I'm talking about. Well, historical, historically informed performance uh, goes back in its current state uh, to around about the 1960s and 1970s, although there have been several attempts to um, uh, restore earlier ways of performing music before this uh, in 17th century, 18th century, and so on. So uh, the, the music history, Western music history, is full of periods of restoration. Uh, but the one that we still belong to, I think, is by far the biggest and most influential, uh, largely because of the inc incredible uh, recordings of performances, uh, broadcasts, and so on. Um, and what are the characteristics of this movement as it began in the 60s and 70s? Um, the first thing that one often hears about is the concept of original instruments. And by that, uh, we mean instruments which are in the original state for the music being performed. Uh, original instruments then being uh, instruments that are contemporary with whatever music you're doing. And the, you can see here that the instruments look like modern instruments, but there are quite a few differences, particularly you'll see with the oboe. Um, obviously, the original instruments or early instruments bring uh, original playing techniques, playing techniques from the period, which are often quite different from those which are employed today uh, with modern instruments. Quite often, historically informed performers look at the original sources of the music. So they look at the music uh, in terms of manuscripts, uh, prints, and so on, and see whether there's something in those sources that will make them play differently. Also, the questions of expression and interpretation, which will go back to what one learns in books and reports of performances in the 17th, 18th centuries, and so on. Uh, and also that might include different forms of ornamentation, whether improvised or following a particular symbol. Another thing you often hear about in connection with historical performance is the need to follow the composer's intentions. The composer's intentions often uh, come at a high premium. Do what the composer intended, not what later people changed. Uh, my final um, suggestion for the at least for the early definition of historical performance, is uh, perhaps the most contentious, which uh, was often expressed in the 1960s and 70s, which was, if you get the correct historical details, the correct instruments for the music concerned, it's actually better than a correct performance, uh, and that it's better to have a bad performance on the right instruments than a good one uh, on, on the wrong instruments. And that is obviously extremely contentious, and I don't think that you'll find many people who will follow that rule nowadays. But a lot of this movement towards historical performance came as a reaction to what was considered to be modern performance practice, which of course is modern versions of instruments, um, modern up-to-date playing techniques, which are often um, very, very technically advanced. They build on the past and often relate to a particular lineage if you are uh, an instrumentalist of a particular field. 
Um, sources of music are sometimes edited with more recent styles of performance in mind. Interpretation is based on the prevailing norms of expression. What's expressive performance? We will follow what we believe expressive performance to be because we've, we've been brought up that way. Uh, full of the composer's intentions, yes, but only to a certain extent because uh, we might want to update what was available to the composer and therefore change things to make, make uh, the, the piece of music notionally better. Um, and, of course, performance standards and flawless virtuoso technique cannot be compromised upon uh, in professional modern performance. Now, from the way I've couched the, the difference between modern performance and historically informed performance, you might think that the two are completely at war with one another, and perhaps they were for a while in the past, although I hope to show ways in which they uh, have joined in many respects already and can still usefully pool resources uh, in the world that we live in today. Um, indeed, I think it might be more accurate for me to say that there are perhaps no longer just the two cultures, modern performance, historical performance, uh, but there's the potential uh, and actuality of many different mixes of bits of historical performance, bits of uh, inherited modern performance. Um, but it's very easy to see why uh, modern performers opposed historical performance, uh, early on at least, uh, after all, the old instruments are often very difficult to play uh, in comparison with the modern ones, uh, and surely the modern instruments must be improvements. Uh, techniques have evolved over the years, and we don't want to squander that tradition of technical perfection. We can often improve on the original scores with modern corrective additions that can show a work of music in what we believe to be a better light, uh, even if it was unknown to the composer or the composer uh, didn't have the resources to perform the music as well as we believe it could be performed. Um, the other thing is that the current state of interpretation in modern performance is often believed to be natural. In other words, we don't want to spoil um, what we've inherited from our teachers with anachronistic throwbacks. Um, another thing that was said early on in the historical performance music, um, movement was that historically informed performers, hip performers, as they're sometimes called, uh, are basically people who have failed to play the proper instruments and take up the old ones instead, and then they have plenty of excuses to, uh, for it to sound bad. Um, and also, early on, it was so popular with the public uh, that these people got paid a huge amount, far more than we do. Um, and, of course, that was taking income away from the real performers, as it were, just for the sake of a passing fad. Well, it still hasn't passed, uh, as I've um, uh, intimated already. A final point, which I think is definitely not true nowadays, is that historically informed performances are puritanical and lacking in expression. They take away everything, uh, um, take away all the varnish, take away anything stylish, uh, and just return it to what uh, uh, was believed to be uh, a pure original. Uh, they are often considered to be acidic and dry rather than warm and expressive in terms of modern performances. Now, this caricature of what's wrong with historical performance um, does have some resonances, I think, with what was done and heard in the 1960s and 70s, although I don't think it was ever entirely true by any means, and it's even less true today, partly because we're on the second, third, fourth generations of players, so we actually have traditions now within historical performance rather than historical performance versus tradition. Tradition has actually become part of it. But there still remains a sort of existential gripe about historical performances. Why do we want to go back to old styles of performance when we've evolved our own? Have we lost our way? Have we forgotten how to play music? Have we run out of imagination? Have we run out of insight into how music should be performed? Uh, well, it is true that in, in uh, Western history and, and indeed world history, there's often a sense of turning back against inherited traditions by analogies with a, a, a more distant past. You could think of the Renaissance itself as being like that, using uh, the ancient classical world as a way of correcting the present, or the Reformation as taking the early... Christian practices to reform the church. So it's not just in music that this notion of returning to the past happens. 
But it, uh, it is true that if one thinks of composition in the 1950s, there were very obvious directions in which classical music was going, um, loosely in the, in the, in the direction of uh, aleatoric music uh, and in very serialized music and electronic music as well. Uh, it was quite clear where uh, music was evolving. But I think so many styles and so many acceptable idioms of composition have arisen since that actually today in terms of composition uh, there's simply no single way forward and it's, it's there's, there's a lot of dispute in other words as to whether any particular new piece of music fits uh, a specific tradition or not so it's not just in performance that this splitting of traditions is happening um, and I think one might say that in our contemporary life, there are many aspects of culture uh, where um, we revel in the sheer diversity of options or um, indeed uh, on the negative side, we might lament that there are no obvious ways forward. Uh, although I think science and medicine valiantly continue with the notion of, of progress uh, constantly improving, uh, and that progressive paradigm has been in place since the, the, the 17th century. But in many other ways, political and, and so on, and cultural, um, there really is quite a variety uh, of ways forwards. So where does this leave performance practices? Um, with historical performance and other types of music, uh, we already have quite a diversity. So in a sense then, perhaps it's much too late now to recreate a tradition, a single tradition of performance, since it's already been contaminated and inflected by so many factors, some to do with historical performance, but some to do with other types of music. Um, and in fact, now I come to think of it, uh, the notion of a single tradition in the past was entirely illusory. There were always many different national schools or different lineages of, of performance for different instruments, uh, different teachers, different schools, and so on. Uh, what gave um, mainstream performance a, a considerable degree of standardization was, of course, the advent of broadcasting and recorded media. And these opened up access to all kinds of music uh, like never before. But there's always been the tendency, though, for performances to become more standardized because you hear how somebody else is doing it and you, you, you imitate them and so on. So uh, certainly, I think, since the Second World War, uh, standardization of classical performance has become quite a common factor um, as the media of, of uh, broadcasting and recording uh, become ever stronger. Um, and indeed, in a variety of musical fields, recorded performances of the same repertory can often sound quite uniform from one to the other, uh, as I say, particularly after World War II, when mass production of uh, technology became much stronger. But if one does listen back to early recordings, ones before World War II, there's actually quite interesting uh, observations to be made about what traditional performance actually was, uh, singing and playing. Um, in other words, when the medium was, was quite new, we hear some quite different ways of approaching music. Um, uh, and it, in fact, it doesn't sound necessarily like what we came to expect from the 50s, 60s, and to a certain extent, up to the present day. Um, indeed, some early 20th century performers, uh, in their traditional way of performing, so they're not thinking of historically informed performance, but in some respects, they actually come quite close to historical performance, for instance, uh, with less vibrato in many traditions for, for string instruments, for wind instruments, and for voices, depending on the school. Some have more than others. Um, many flexible lines and many variations and inflections of tempo are there in early recordings. Uh, and singing, in particular, is very much text-led. Even, even the big opera houses um, tended to have singers who... Uh, use the text as a way of leading the, leading the voice rather than vice versa. And now, some of these things are heard in earlier styles or m might be heard in earlier styles. Of course, we don't have recordings of the 18th century, unfortunately. Um, but so some things like portamenti, for instance, seem to be a peculiarity of the uh, beginning of the 20th century, although one can find references to them in earlier treatises. So in all, then, uh, there is tremendous variety historically uh, not just in historical performances between different countries, different periods, different composers, but also in terms of the mainstream. The mainstream itself is not as uniform, perhaps, as some of us might have been led to believe. 
Now, um, I'm going to, what I'm going to do in much of the rest of what I have to say is take common objections to historical approaches to performance and see how valid they are uh, and whether we can come to a compromise as to whether what historical performance does is at least valid. I'm not, never going to say that historical performance is the only way one should perform music of any kind, uh, but uh, there are certain advantages and indeed disadvantages. So my first topic then is the notion of instruments, uh, modern instruments, uh, being obviously better than the older uh, ones because following technology, following advances in science and following uh, advances in medicine, uh, we do believe that things can get better in terms of human endeavour through progress, through building on the mistakes of the past. So it does make logical sense that mod modern versions of instruments are in some ways better um, and they certainly are often more reliable and dependable for the player, so they make the player more comfortable. Uh, and many of the modern uh, changes to instruments overcome some of the limitations, the obvious limitations of early instruments. But I would suggest, though, that if limitations and reliability are the main problems with instruments, then surely this uh, would, uh, would naturally lead us towards ever more perfect instruments. That, if one thinks of the advantages in electronic or electric-assisted instruments, could almost disp dispense with the player altogether, because the player is always going to be unreliable at some point, so why not go even further? And certainly there are many repertories in, in new music uh, and aesthetics where this notion of absolute perfection, where you can almost get rid of the performer, might be desirable. There, might be, there are certain types of music where that's possible. But I think you'll, you'll get from what I'm saying is that, that constantly improving technology tempts us to remove the human factor in performance, particularly, I would suggest, our vulnerability as performers, which I think can be expressively productive, the, the fact that we actually have to uh, uh, have uh, e effort that you can actually hear in performing something, I think does count for quite a lot of musical expression. So to make everything totally easy does take away that notion of interaction between human and instrument, and indeed the instrument could be their own voice. Uh, indeed, quite often what counts in music making uh, is a performer's negotiation of limitations. So uh, I would suggest that difficulty and danger are often part of the package. Not always, but often. Uh, would we really be impressed by singers who could sing across the octaves with absolutely no sense of strain, just like turning a knob? Uh, would, that, would that actually... Uh, sound musical to us. Uh, and even if we cannot sing or play the instruments concerned, I mean, I, there are many instruments I, um, that, that, uh, I can't play, but I can usually intuit which bits of a performance are difficult and uh, which bits require a certain gesture or a certain type of strain or a certain type of relaxation. You can often intuit that in performance, and to my mind, that is actually very much part of what musical performance involves, the interaction between human and instrument. But some people might be saying already, doesn't the fact remain, if J.S. Bach had the modern piano, he would surely have loved it. There's a modern piano, there's a harpsichord. Um, well, the answer, I think, would almost certainly be affirmative. I'm sure he would have loved it. But, of course, Bach, uh, around 1920, when the modern piano sort of got to its most, most uh, perfected state, uh, Bach would be a very different person, I think, in 1920 than he would have been in 1730. And, indeed, if he was still composing uh, at a very great age, uh, would he not compose new things? Uh, so, yes, he might well have liked the piano and almost certainly would have done, but he would have written different music for it. Um, now, this is not the same as me saying that it is wrong to play the music that he did actually write on the modern, modern piano. It's just the strong likelihood that the instrument itself would have given him new ideas, new possibilities, which are quite different from what happened when he was playing for, uh, composing for organ or harpsichord. Now, the keyboard instruments of Bach's time were seldom absolutely perfect, and often they were quite unreliable in some respects and difficult to play. Uh, 
But I would suggest that this interaction with the difficulties and the limitations actually not only played into the way people performed, uh, playing, getting around their limitations, but actually would have gone into Bach's creative process. So his knowledge of the stretch required to play a certain chord or the pressure required to play a certain type of figuration, that would actually be part of the embodied experience of composing uh, onto paper. So uh, I could uh, say here, as a, as a sort of personal belief, um, that my interest in historical instruments comes from the way in which they both inspired and they limited composers and performers uh, of the past. Uh, and that interaction with both composer and performer is something that seeded into the way the music is written. With fine players today, um, uh, this sort, th th these instruments can continue to inspire and also limit in certain ways the players. Um, if one factor of performance facilitated by more modern instruments is unavailable, the best performers will often find ways of using other elements of performance to achieve expression. Um, in other words, if, if one thinks of keyboard instruments, uh, they don't respond to weight of touch in terms of dynamic shaping, so we have to find other ways of making the music expressive. So if I play a middle C really gently, it sounds like that. If I play it quite heavily, it sounds like that. It sounds exactly the same, uh, which means that when I'm playing, I actually have to... the way I place the notes in time, uh, I have to give much more attention to that to give the music uh, character and expression, uh, which one wouldn't have to do so much if one had the dynamics of a modern piano. Uh, one could play it completely in time and use, use the dynamics. So it forces you to think of another parameter of expression. Um, so that's one aspect of a limitation actually becoming an opportunity uh, in a certain sense. Um, so to summarise then, early instruments often tie in uh, with the way the composer composed in the first place. Some things become easier today as a result of using the older instruments, but some things actually become more difficult. But this difficulty can often engender elements of expression uh, that greater ease would actually obscure. I might also add that now with the later generations of performers, uh, the actual technical facility has gone up a huge amount, and some of the things that were previously seen as difficulties in playing an old instrument actually become easier uh, uh, now that players no longer have to uh, familiarise themselves with the instruments. They've become much more comfortable with it. Well, what I'm going to do now is do our first musical example uh, based around a historical instrument. And what is the most authentic historical instrument of all? Of course, it is the voice. Uh, so many uh, treatises and textbooks on, on performance say, imitate the voice. The voice is the beginning of all music. So that's where we're going to work with. And we're going to uh, play a movement from a Bach cantata, Lief de Jesu, number 32, uh, with Joanne Lunn singing the soprano part and, and Lot de Meyer playing uh, a Baroque oboe. So you can sort of hear how those two interact. I'll just give a little background to the uh, cantata before we play it. Um, the cantata is based on the gospel set for the day, which is the story of the young Jesus in the temple uh, when his parents temporarily lost him. Uh, he turns out to be conversing with the clerics uh, and is almost amused by the fact that his parents are worried that they've lost him. Uh, and he says that he is in his father's house after all. Uh, and the opening aria of this cantata takes this notion of potential loss of Jesus as a meditation for the believer, expressing the sorrow that the loss of Jesus would bring. So it's almost as if the aria is written in the subjunctive. This is what it would be like. But later on, we have a, a moment of absolute wonderful great joy at finding Jesus and, and embracing him. And that's a great opportunity for the voice to sing an incredible amount of coloratura. I'm going to play an extract, we're going to play an extract of this first with, um, uh, with Joanne singing in a more or less modern style, so not thinking of historical performance, so to give you an idea of how this would normally sound perhaps with a, with a soprano who'd not been trained in historical techniques, and then we'll see what techniques she is adding uh, to make it uh, informed by history. That, as I say, there's no uh, necessary 
correct way of doing this, but where one uses historical awareness and knowledge to slightly change the way of performance. So you'll hear, the, uh, hopefully, um, a contrast between the two. So uh, we'll tune up and just do a, an extract with a sort of modern style singing, and then we'll talk about historical singing. I mean, it's very, very beautiful. I don't think anybody could complain about uh, what Joey is doing in terms of a sound there. Uh, what do we know, though, about Baroque singing? Um, well, nothing for certain, to be honest. We, nothing is absolutely certain. But we are uh, used to using clues and negotiating things that we learn from the past. Um, one of the things about uh, Baroque singing, for instance, is that they... Uh, writers about it tend to say that, that the singing teacher should uh, work on the specific qualities of each individual voice so that not everybody sounds the same. So we need to find, as it were, the affordances of Joe's voice uh, in order to make it fit this sort of music. And, uh, and she's particularly good at these very small expressive gestures. And that's another thing that one finds in early treatises on singing is that one uh, can swell and uh, um, reduce the voice very, very spontaneously for small notes and small phrases, as well as in terms of the larger phrase. So a lot more detailed, um, dynamic range. And of course, given this is a dialogue with the oboe, uh, almost sort of a, a metaphor for the dialogue between the believer and Jesus, uh, one uh, wants to hear the two, as it were, as intimately intertwined. Uh, and by having that more nuanced sty style that Joe develops, um, uh, which, as I say, does have some historical evidence, that does make it uh, much more of a dialogue. Um, one also tends to get less vibrato in uh, early singing, or at least references to less vibrato, but using vibrato as a way of targeting particular expressive moments rather than necessarily having it all there all the time. So it's using it strategically rather than as, uh, as something that's there. Uh, and that, again, gives a real sense of the ebb and flow uh, of the music. <clears throat> 
And then finally, uh, there is this issue of uh, coloratura. Uh, if one looks at any uh, treatise on, on singing, really up to the mid-19th century, one of the things that takes up most of the space is singing fast. We tend to think of singers as being slow nowadays and instrumentalists as being fast. But in fact, for much of Western music history, it was the other way around. The singer, the virtuosity of the throat uh, and the, the whole system of the larynx was seen uh, as where a lot of the skill of singing lay. And when she expresses joy towards the end of this aria in relation to the refinding of Jesus, you'll hear that wonderful uh, type of coloratura she does. So in other words, then, these techniques create more of a duet, more of a dialogue, which, of course, was spiritually important for uh, listeners in Bach's Leipzig, but is also uh, important, I think, for audiences today to understand how the moods interact. Um, and uh, as I say, although the, the historical ideas never give us certainty, they can give us uh, a, a way of thinking about a more nuanced and variegated performance, uh, and also one that builds, to a certain extent, on the vulnerabilities of the, of the human voice. Trying to find those bits where you have to stretch for a particular note are often uh, the most musical moments. So let's now play the entire movement um, with Joanne singing how she has evolved her own Baroque style of singing. And a Baroque oboe, as you can tell, is a different sound to a modern oboe. Very hard to play, but an absolutely exquisite sound. Uh, really, really beautiful sound. And it's actually somewhat louder than some, some modern instruments as well. So, so it does have a real sort of human quality. So you hear the, the link between voice and instrument very, very clearly uh, here. Uh, let's just see whether you need to tune again. One of the big advantage, disadvantages of historical instruments is you have to tune them all the time. Gut strings. Mm -hmm. 
you add, Joe? Do you want to add anything to what I've said already? No, only that um, really with early, early instruments, we have a really different colour. Yeah. Um, and that's the So we, we all work together as a, a big team and it, it mm. creates lovely opportunities for colour. Thank you. Thank you. Come on. Uh, well, I suppose you turn the tune from a modern oboe and onto rock oboe, mm. and it's always a very different experience. Um, I think this one really is a much nicer match with the bass mm. section and a jazz player in the team. Well, thank you very much. Great. So that's uh, talking a little bit about instruments. We'll talk a bit more later about how instruments interact with one another. I'm going to talk a little bit now about sources of music. Um, quite often, music is uh, edited with recent styles in mind. Uh, and this is often the case even with the most supremely scholarly editions, which can often reflect the norms of their age, even when the editors think they are writing and, and editing uh, for all ages, but uh, every age is inflected by its own interests and needs. Uh, but I think one of the things that historical performance does try and do is promote a knowledge and familiarity with a whole range of sources so that we have an idea of what this music looks like when it's written down in the original sources, uh, editions, uh, manuscripts, and so on, and also to make an informed guess as to how these original manuscripts related to the first performances. Now, most modern interpretative editions will often determine a particular way of playing. They'll put in extra phrase marks sometimes, uh, or you might indeed sometimes get a great player's fingering or phrasing put in, which is, of course, extremely useful if you want to sort of learn from a master like that. But older sources tend to be inevitably incomplete, and I think this is the important thing to realise about everything from the past. It's incomplete. Um, and it's something that, of course, um, parallels the relative limitations of earlier instruments. Now, this incompleteness, I think, can often be an invitation for variety and a range of differing interpretations, some of which are more historically verifiable than others. And even comparing a modern scholarly edition of, say, a piece by Mozart with a composer's autograph often reveals a completely different feel to the music. Um, in other words, the best or the most faithful editions will look very formal and symmetrical, a very clean edition of Mozart's music, uh, with at least some of the anomalies, perhaps, ironed out, inconsistencies. Uh, but if you look at Mozart's original scores, they're often very scrappy and rushed, and in places it looks as if he's improvising on the spot and almost writing at the speed of the music. If the music gets faster, his notes lean over like, like runners. Um, he didn't realise, of course, Mozart, that he was going to be turned into a monument. Uh, he thought he was a, a performing musician who, who wrote down the music as a way of enabling performance. And I think by looking at the original sources, you can get something of that freshness which you would not necessarily get from looking at a modern edition, even if it's a very scholarly one. Now, of course, we might not necessarily want to add to the notes that Mozart wrote, although there's much evidence that we might do that if we follow what he did. But we might be inspired by the performative traces of his own notation. In other words, where, did it, where does it look as if he's improvised or uh, ornamented something beyond what he did before? Um, you, can, you can certainly learn something from that. So in other words, taking a critical and historical eye to a range of sources is actually an opening to diversifying performance practices rather than a way of necessarily limiting them to a modern norm or something that's assumed to be absolutely correct historically. Now, the several ways in which notation might relate to how the music was originally performed, uh, it might be just the composer's jotting down of the essentials, and he, uh, he or she would assume that the performer would know how to do the rest, uh, to cook it, as it were, according to conventions of the time. Um, in other words, it might be a recipe. Uh, it might be an example of the way the music could go, um, which is, is often the case, uh, which could, be, of course, be changed by the performer. In other words, even if the composer was extremely clear about how a particular piece should be played, perhaps that was just an example in some cases. Uh, sometimes musical notation might be a souvenir of a past performance. In other words, this is how a particular singer sang this piece, so uh, I'm going to show you the ornaments. Um, 
But uh, the other thing is that we tend to assume that uh, a composer always wants to fix the performance entirely in the notation so that we have no leeway as performers as to what we do. Uh, and this certainly is the case in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. But even here, if we listen to early recordings, uh, sometimes made by the composers themselves, we realize that the strategy of making the music fit the, fit the performance and vice versa often failed, uh, that composers, uh, even if they wrote things down absolutely meticulously, played the music completely differently. Uh, a good example of this, for instance, is, is Messiaen playing his own organ music. I once spent about a week just learning one movement of a piece by Messiaen, which had all sorts of um, triplets, uh, deck tuplets, and so on, all uh, superimposed upon one another. I got it absolutely correct and thought, now I'll listen to how he did it. Uh, and he was completely wrong. Um, so uh, there, there, there is the, 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 the idea that the notation shows you exactly how to perform a piece at any point in music history uh, needs to be taken with a certain amount of circumspection. But one thing that particularly interests me is that sometimes composers wrote music for the eye uh, on paper but had a different conception of the same piece of music in terms of the ear. In other words, what you write on, on paper might be something really perfected as a, as a sort of musical uh, um, souvenir of a style, uh, but when you come to perform it, you do something differently. And I think one composer who comes very much into this category is Arcangelo Corelli, the Italian, great Italian violinist. He became known for the perfection of his music in notation, a sort of classic before the classical era, in a way, uh, and it became the model for Baroque trios and Baroque concertos. Uh, the music had something of the same care in terms of the way the, the structure of the music was written uh, as one might have found in Palestrina a century or so before, by which lines and gestures are designed to match one another and dissonances are carefully handled. One might think of this as the Apollonian uh, Corelli, the, the, the sort of uh, Apollo model of the musician. Yet uh, many, many anecdotes suggest that he was a, quite a wild performer, almost maniacal, who improvised many more runs around his notation. So he has a Dionysian side as well, a completely wild side. Um, and we have a few clues as to how this Dionysian Corelli might have worked, uh, particularly in addition of his, uh, in an addition of his violin sonatas from about 1710, ten years after they were originally published, uh, in which the uh, Dutch publisher claimed to be re reproducing what Corelli actually wrote. But we'll come to that in a minute. Uh, I've, I have Matthew here, Matthew Truscott playing violin and Lucia Capillaro on cello, and I'll play the harpsichord. And what we'll do is perform the piece as originally notated by Corelli. And this is the very first of his violin sonatas, the opening movement of Opus 5, number 1. <laughs> 
So that's more or less as it was notated by Corelli. And of course, I have to play chords, which I improvise around. So it's, it's not entirely exactly what was in the notation, but in terms of the top and bottom, yes. Um, now, in, as I said, in 1710, a Dutch publisher claimed to produce an edition which showed the ornaments that Corelli himself played. We, of course, don't know for sure that this is true, although many people uh, believe it, it, it is pretty indicative of what, what Corelli did. It might have just been part of a sales pitch, like having a, a sort of recording of the original composer. Uh, but certainly they do seem to reflect uh, Corelli's practice. And uh, that beautiful shape that we had before is now entirely encrusted. Well, you, you wait to hear what we hear. So that's purportedly how Corelli did it. Well done. Um, now, what about, though, uh, not taking that literally, in other words, what the notation says literally, but surely that could well be taken as an example of how to play it. And then we could ask Matthew to make up his own version of the ornaments. So, so uh, we, we have practiced this a couple of times, but I'm sure he'll catch us out. We're going to have to try and, uh, and follow how he does his own ornamentation, which is not notated uh, in the manuscript. So this is our third attempt at the same piece. Uh, 
Okay. Great. Well, I, th I think, yes, it, what's interesting is that, you know, looking at the original notation doesn't, in fact, limit you. Uh, often people think it will limit you, but actually, as we've shown here, it can often reveal new possibilities of performance, which I think is, is really very striking. Uh, it makes us also rethink the whole nature of the, of the fixed nature of musical works, showing them to be actually ever-living formulations rather than uh, absolutely fixed forms. Now, what about styles of expression? You've obviously heard quite a lot of the styles of expression we've been developing here. Um, have we lost prevailing norms? Um, in fact, I think it would be wrong to say that the current situation is a free-for-all of expression. There are many micro-traditions now of performance, both in historical performance and other types as well. And commentators often state that the develops, uh, development in music since the time of whatever repertory we're playing mean that we cannot ignore later sounds and that we cannot ex exclude later sounds from our expressive vocabulary. Um, one fre frequent example of this uh, ex um, argument is that in the medieval era, the interval of the third was considered dissonant rather than consonant, as it is today. And some claim that we can't hear them uh, as dissonant in the wake of all the mellif mellifluous thirds that we've heard in virtually all tonal music. But I would say that there's something wrong with that idea that we cannot uh, learn more than one language of music. Surely we're capable of speaking more than one language, even if it's imperfectly. Uh, and we also have the ability to master a diversity of styles. So, in other words, the notion that there's only one form of expressive musicality that is natural and somehow cumulative, uh, and that it's there for all to hear, is, I think, a fallacy. Uh, the very fact that we can listen to music from wildly different periods, and indeed in completely different traditions, such as pop jazz and, and world music, without hearing them as all equally musical in the same way, uh, I think shows that we can learn different languages of expression. Um, and without necessarily letting one permeate the other, although there can be some very productive permeations. So in other words, if historical performance has taught us anything, uh, it's, there is far more diversity, both in our inherited traditions, but across the whole musical spectrum of today's world. Uh, we not be able, to be able to appreciate everything, not everybody does, uh, and we might also have a very imperfect understanding of the music that we relate to, but it's cl clear, I think, after several generations of historical performers that most of these performers have essentially learnt a range of languages with a long period of practice and communal experience. Uh, and also, many of these people play different instruments for different eras, so they, again, they have more uh, uh, styles of instruments to play, including many people play modern instruments as well here. So from this point of view, then, historical performance is very much of a piece with the hugely diversified cultural world in which we live, uh, and indeed has made significant contributions. Now, what about the uh, expression that's shared between singers and players? We heard a little bit of this earlier with, with Joanne and, and Lot. Um, and what we're going to do is, is play a Handel aria now uh, from Samson, um, Total Eclipse, which is perhaps the most famous aria from Samson. And it's Samson's lament on his blindness while he's in Philistine uh, captivity. His eyes are, are put out when he loses his strength because his hair got cut. You know the story. Um, clearly, this uh, mourning of his eyesight is a very expressive emotional piece. But how do we get expression, particularly with Baroque strings? Uh, Baroque bows, for instance, are generally shorter than modern ones, and they are balanced very differently. Um, and very slow tempi are very hard to execute, uh, which is not to say they have to be excluded altogether. And also, if we're not using so much vibrato, uh, the actual bow and the stroke of the bow actually has to create the expression. It's rather the equivalent of the, of the voice uh, the breath 
in the voice, controlling the expression, um, and differences of speed, direction, and pressure uh, are, very, are far more important with these old bows than they are with modern bows. In other words, the expression can be quite detailed uh, compared with a more generalized expression of a continuous vibrato, which modern performance still uh, t tends to have. But the other thing I think that's particularly, you'll notice particularly here, is the way uh, these instruments articulate as if they actually had words, which suggests that they're responding uh, to the tenor's text. So here we got uh, Hugo Hymus singing the part of Samson in uh, Total Eclipse. Uh, and what we're looking for is how we achieve expression with older instruments. <laughs> Stop. 
and you go here with Hugo style, uh, Hugo style of singing, uh, that the text really leads the, 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 the music, uh, and the instruments are able to uh, mimic that too in many different ways and create his mood. And, all, and also get this wonderful contralto sound in the violins as they go onto the G string, which uh, exploits the differences of the, of the gut strings uh, very clearly. Anything either of you want to add at this point? Yeah, I mean, I, I think in this particular <laughs> in between the phrases and I think that gives the opportunity I think to communicate with the orchestra mm -hmm. which is one thing I think I love about performing this music is that ability to um, collaborate and mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's and, we, and we, sh we, we show the audience what you're thinking yeah. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. yes that's right exactly great thank, thank you very much indeed Good. A final topic. Yes, we're, we're, we'll soon be there. Uh, this issue of following composers' intentions. Uh, this is often an injunction in all forms of musical performance in the classical tradition. Um, so for many years, it was the key mantra, I think, of historical performance. Follow what the composer wants. We only want to do what the composer wants. But you might ask, how do we know what the composer wants? Uh, well, we have manuscripts, we have various documents, we have the styles that were current, or some notion of the styles that were current at the time. Um, and, but, but is the composer clear in the notation, uh, and does the composer actually cover all aspects of performance? And I've said already that it's clear that uh, notation doesn't do that. Um, and how do we know, for instance, when a composer didn't expect us to deviate, as we've done already, or, as so often happens with composers, change his or her mind later and have a, a second thoughts. So in short, then, the issue of intention is quite problematic, and we often attribute a sort of godlike status to the composer as someone who is all-knowing and all-seeing and also valid for all ages. Uh, but uh, I'm sure you've met some composers. Uh, they are often fallible, I find, uh, and many have interesting priorities, which you don't expect. Uh, there, for instance, is the famous story of Beethoven becoming furious when a pupil missed crucial aspects of expression in the music, uh, but Beethoven had no concern when the pupil played wrong notes. So it's fine to get the music wrong, but to get the wrong expression made him go absolutely wild. Um, so in other words, composers have different priorities, and what if a composer was not particularly good as a composer uh, and we want to play the music? Uh, what do we do then? Do we, do we try and improve it? Or perhaps a composer didn't understand the instruments involved. That happens quite often as well. So what interests me about intention is not so much the composer's express wishes or commands, although these have to be taken seriously, uh, but what's interesting to me is what I would call the intentiveness behind the music, the fact that a composer, like any artist, has a whole string of intentions uh, that change and develop every single second of the creative process. So uh, intentions are things which are there in the way the music is written uh, in real time. So as part of this notion of intentiveness, there's the issue of instrumental affordances, which I've mentioned already. In other words, the choices that a composer makes are often, um, both early and late in the compositional process, are often conditioned by the particular instruments expected. Uh, composers such as Handel, who we just heard, were often thinking of actual singers and building their music around the different qualities and techniques of each. Um, that was a particularly famous singer we just heard there, John Beard, um, impersonated by Hugo. Um, so, for instance, if you look at Messiah, there are five different versions of Thou Art Gone Up on High. It's not because Handel didn't have, uh, uh, you know, he was unconfident about how this music should go is because he had different singers and therefore retailed it for the new singer. So I think if we think of that sense of intentiveness, how various aspects of the process actually change a composer's uh, process of composing, um, we essentially capture some idea of the creative energy behind a piece uh, and perhaps find some ways of trying to recapture the freshness of the original conception. So this, to me, is the most creative and inspiring aspect of the whole field of intention. Everything else to do with wishes and commands is something for debate and our judgment. But I think we should never let it lead to a hard and fast answer, however much some might wish for it.
So having given some of the outlines and views of the sorts of things that historical performance allows to do, what might its relevance be for us today? And should it replace every other way of doing things? Well, as I think is already completely obvious, I don't think that there's a single ideal that is generated by historically informed thinking. Unlike some of the earlier pioneers, we surely realize that history in general is incomplete and surviving traces from the past are often there just by chance or through the decisions of curators in later eras who had particular tastes. If we had the absolute perfect history, we'd essentially be, be reliving the past era as if it were in a time machine, and we'd also get all the smells, believe it or not. So not only then uh, do our own view and biases affect our view of history, but there's hopefully a virtuous circle between what we learn from past evidence, our own presuppositions, uh, and that these mutually inflect one another. Our presuppositions changed as we find new evidence, but as we find new evidence and, and gain new presuppositions, we look for different types of evidence. So partic particularly when it relates to performance, uh, history then is, I think, an ongoing dialogue between what we know already and believe already and what we find. So new ways of understanding the past often make us find new sources of interest and inspiration, even when we thought we'd exhausted the whole body of evidence. Now, one area that we've forgotten about for many years is the role of the audience. Uh, and I think there's no point in having a historical performance if no one hears it. Um, so this uh, process of hearing, I think, is often just as influential as the process of performance. Now, obviously, we don't want to necessarily recreate the more restrictive process uh, and practices of historical listening, but I think we can learn quite a lot from looking at early concerts in, say, coffee houses and taverns, uh, church music within a broader liturgy, dance within a court culture, opera in, within the early opera houses. And there's also uh, the question of understanding the dispositions of historical listeners. For instance, in the time of Bach and Handel, some people actually believe still in the palpable interaction of music and spiritual presence. Their spirits tied in with their body, their emotion, and their thoughts. And they believe that their emotions could be cleansed and purged through musical stimuli. Although there are obvious differences, there are some similarities between this very, very visceral approach to music and certain charismatic religious practices today. And in the secular field in particular, there are many instances of listeners being moved to near hysteria, sometimes in an environment that was considerably more noisy than our modern concert halls. How did they sustain such attention? And then, as is so often forgotten in Western classical music, there is movement and the modelling of movement in musical practice and musical gestures, most obviously in the dance forms and actual dances that we play, but also in the various gates of walking and human movement. Uh, in other words, by extension, many pieces of music contain gestures that borrow from dance, even in church music. And indeed, if one thinks of the Matthew Passion, the final chorus is a perfectly orthodox saraband. So then, together then, with awareness of audience practices, dispositions and expectations, there's an all, a strong sense that music moves people through what it does, rather than necessarily through its very specific meanings, through what it represents. And this is one of my final examples now, is to show how music can do something to us in the way we hear it performed, which relates to the meaning and the emotion here. Uh, we're going to have Jess Dandy, contralto, and Matthew playing violin solo um, in the wonderful aria Ebarmadish by Bach from the Matthew Passion. This comes just after the scene where Peter's weakness leads him to deny that he knows Jesus three times, and then he hears the cock crow exactly as Jesus had predicted. The aria continues after this point with a very different voice after, after Peter weeps, and it's not Peter's voice we hear, nor the evangelists. It suggests that it's another voice from our present who shares in the emotion of human failure, now expressed by the alto voice. So in a reflection on human weakness in general, uh, the text is, uh, have mercy on me for the sake of my tears. 
The aria then is a lament begging for mercy. Yet the aria is also surprisingly comforting. And I'm going to try and show how it does this. How can this aria be comforting as well as showing human weakness? Well, first of all, I think it's the way the instrumental parts are written is that the instrumental parts are built around the first eight bars, uh, which produces a small but perfect piece of music, the perfect ritinello, which is reused at various points in the aria. Uh, so let's just play that ritinello first. with a beginning, middle, and end, very, very emotional in its own right. And the whole piece is based on this. It repeats in different ways, sometimes complete, sometimes in a different key, sometimes incomplete. And in fact, we have the beginning of a complete repetition when the voice comes in. Uh, and the voice comes in with exactly the melody, which is this. And if one were kept following the violin part, the next line would... It is impossible to sing. Um, and then uh, when the violin goes, uh, you just have a, a, a frame. Und meine so it's as if the, the, the singer is trying to sing what the violin had, but fails quite magnificently and expressively so. And this happens all the way through. In fact, you never hear the singer sing the opening melody all the way through. And I think this is meant to show, in other words, that you have this background to the music which repeats. Sometimes you don't notice it repeating as well. It's as if you have a sort of secure, some, some order behind our human reality that repeats uh, where even when we don't notice it, and that we, as it were, fit within that order with our very human and very imperfect voices. And um, Jess's imperfect voice is absolutely fantastic. So let's <laughs> hear the entire aria. Thank you. 
So what we have there is the supreme security of a beautifully written piece of music with re returning bits that, that give the piece security, comfort. We have the sense of weakness, but also expression in the vocal part. And all is what the music does, rather than what it means through a symbolic notation, which I think is very important, that the way the music sounds. Anything you, you would like to add? Yeah, it's really, it's really interesting. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I performed this aria with a modern orchestra um, at 440. <laughs> and um, the way that, that my voice works is that my passaggio um, pretty much kicks in around mm. E flat, E natural. So actually, the aria feels radically different mm. to, to sing um, mm. at 415. And the, the texture um, into which I'm so beautifully integrated feels mm. far more luxuriant, mm. but also constricting mm. in a way. Um, mm. There's more of a sensation of, mm. of drowning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think um, I was talking to Matthew about actually um, in terms of um, in terms of how to approach mm. style mm. and um, I think for me it's far more unconscious so mm. that it's such a privilege to, mm. to sort of immerse myself mm. in, in the sound of these historic mm. instruments mm. and that then subconsciously then my voice changes mm -hmm. it's almost like an involuntary mm. attunement to, yeah. to what is what is yeah. happening yeah. and I think what you so beautifully talked about this sort of idea of the of the human condition um, being established in this this mm. aria, um, with the idea that that I that I can't mm. um, imitate the, the violin, mm. there is hope already. There is mercy within mm. that because, mm. in some ways, Matthew as my mm. counterpart mm. actually provides me with with. With a, almost like a wish fulfillment. Yes, yeah, and well, obviously, if you approach this from a religious point of view, you could think of him as being the Godhead or Jesus, exactly. you know, as somebody so, who, who yeah. lies behind you. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, and so, so when I come back um, to the, the tonic at the beginning, mm -hmm. having made no progress, mm -hmm. I've made all the progress mm -hmm. in the world. Yeah, way. yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah. That's thank, it. thank you very much. Thank you. That's really, really interesting. Yeah. Good. Well, we're in our very last couple of minutes now. Um, so what I've been trying to say then is that historical awareness and using historical knowledge, far from closing off options, actually opens up possibilities and new ways of appreciating music and renewing music from the past. It does have the potential to deaden performances if we take the historical evidence too literally, uh, but it also brings the supreme possibility of enlivening and rejuvenating our culture. Uh, it's surely also evident that there's no one way of being historically informed. We've heard different sort of perspectives already this afternoon, and different performers and different scholars often have different priorities for what they borrow from the past. It's also clear that there are a range of attitudes ranging from the puritanical cliché um, of the hi historically informed hip performer doggedly following every aspect of a supposed historical practice uh, to the performer who links historical practice to completely anachronistic elements, new music, for instance, or different types of music played on old instruments, or indeed there are quite a lot of op operatic productions that use a historically informed orchestra but have a postmodern staging. Um, we'll play an example in a minute of this mixing of the ancient and modern. While not all these efforts are necessarily successful, we should surely not dismiss the whole range of historically informed and inspired performance styles, even when they're mixed with more modern ones. One huge upside, I think, of all this is that many modern orchestras uh, adopt some aspects of historical performance already, uh, sometimes even having different sets of instruments for different types of repertory, uh, since they've been inspired by some of the gestures and articulations they've heard from uh, uh, people who've experimented with historical styles. So for our last example then, what about the notion of mixing old and new? Um, last year, Dunedin Consort commissioned a new opera by Erilyn Wallen called Dido's Ghost. Uh, it was a sequel to Dido and Aeneas, derived from Ovid's Fasti, which tells the story of a couple, a couple of decades later when Aeneas encounters a strange woman uh, coming half drowned out of the sea on the Roman shore. He soon realizes that it is Anna, otherwise known as Anna Perenna, who was Dido's sister, who looks remarkably similar to Dido, 
not only is immediately haunted by this double of his earlier love, uh, but her arrival makes his wife, Lavinia, extremely jealous to the degree that she plots to murder Anna. Uh, in, the, in the opera, the characters reminisce about the past at the palace and together perform Purcell's complete opera as a way of recalling the past, so an opera within an opera, in other words. But the opera within the opera begins to blend with the new material and Purcell's music becomes ever fragmented in the final act. So this doubles the haunting from the past that Aeneas experiences, uh, and in fact, at one point, he experiences Dido's ghost speaking to him, who is also played by the same singer who does Anna, and who also plays Dido in the Purcell uh, performance. So the little short extract we're going to do comes from this ghostly encounter, a music uh, at this stage which is also very much haunted by Purcells, and particularly the Lament, uh, the opera is written for Baroque orchestra with multiple percussion and bass guitar, but this section uses mainly strings and harpsichord. Unfortunately, we, there is a bit for bass guitar that we're missing out. Uh, and for this, we have Joanne Lunn as our uh, Dido's ghost and Hugo Hymus as Aeneas. So I hope you enjoy this as our very last bit of the show. So. Mm -hmm. 
for, first of all, thank you for your beautiful performances, um, your incredibly insightful words. Um, apparently, I don't know if you can hear me, but this is for the live stream. So after the introduction, I was told that I was basically miming for the entire first part. So I'll make sure to speak into this microphone, even though um, I don't know if it's doing anything for all of you. Um, anyway, I'd like to open up the floor for some, for some questions. I can't quite see. I'm going to step over here. Um, would anyone in the audience uh, like to ask John or any of the other performers um, a question? I know I have some students here, <clears throat> just um, not enforcing anyone to, uh, to ask a question, of course, although it would be greatly appreciated, make our class look very, put it in a very good light. Yes. And if you could please also speak in the microphone for the same, same reason. Here you go. Uh I have no formal musical training at all, unlike probably everyone here. So take that as a, you know, as a preface. But I just wanted to say thank you very much for an excellent, excellent uh, lecture and performance. I'm a huge fan of your consort. And I wanted to ask a question um, sort of focused on a particular recording that you've made on the Messiah. I think it's by far <laughs> the best recording of the Messiah I've ever heard in my life. And um, can you go through f sort of from stem to stern about the decisions you made, about the version you chose and the recording place and the, the tempos? I just kind of want to know how, you know, hip happens in real life. Well, uh, uh, yeah, it's a long story. This, uh, I mean, back in 2006 when we did that some time ago, um, there was not a very good recording. In fact, there was no real recording of the very first uh, version of the piece. We don't know absolutely everything about the first version, but we know quite a few things. Uh, uh, in Dublin in 1742, uh, and Handel uh, made a few tweaks, uh, even from his composing score, that gives that particular version a particular color to it. There's a lot of contralto sound, for instance. So that was one of the things that we were concentrating on. Um, and certain versions of movements that you don't hear in other versions that he dropped later, but, but belong, are integral to that particular version. So we thought there ought to be at least one recording. I don't say that every recording should be that version, but it's, it's one recording to show you uh, what that first version was like. But the other thing that, of course, interests me is that given it was the first version, it was the first time Messiah had ever been heard, and therefore, what was it like when it was first heard? And uh, from my point of view, what I did a lot was look at the manuscript and see how he'd composed it, uh, not just in terms of which notes he chose, but the order in which he wrote them, uh, the, the, the speed at which he wrote certain movements, and the sort of what I might call the wet ink quality. So that was one thing that was particularly important to me. Um, Tempe, you did mention, I mean, that, that this is a huge issue, which I won't go into in great detail, but one thing that is interesting about Messiah is that a lot of the fast choruses with lots of coloratura were actually adapted from virtuoso Italian duets for really uh, expert singers. So it struck me that uh, one of the important things in the fast choruses was to get this sense of brilliant coloratura uh, that soloists bring. And by having a small chorus in which the soloists actually lead their respective lines, you actually get the entire chorus, which is only three to a part in this case, um, giving a soloistic edge to, the, uh, to, to those lines. Um, so uh, there are many, many different factors, but, but that's possibly the ones that were most important to me in the process of, of preparation. But anyway, thank you very much for your question. And as you say, you, you, you claim not to have musical training, but in some ways that's the most important listener of all, I think, are the people who are drawn in by what we try and do and how we react to what you hear and what you, uh, you, you find pleasurable, because we also are listeners, and uh, um, I think it's very important uh, that we have, we have listeners of all kinds uh, all the time. Uh, it's so crucial. Absolutely. Um, um, any other questions? Or answers? Or answers. <laughs> As I say, there aren't really answers, to be honest. They're, they're, they're all issues of likelihood, uh, issues of possibility, but no real complete answers. While we wait, oh, I have, have one back here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for 
coming. Uh, it's to hear you live. I it's at this beautiful small hall is a real pleasure. Um, so I had a couple of questions I'll throw out. One is just the the nature. One of the hip uh, questions would be what kind of singer to sing these lines. Particularly, I was thinking of Erbamadif, mm -hmm. and that you would have not had women singing in the church setting. Mm -hmm. um, and I was really just first of all applause again for Jesse. I think it just an astounding mm -hmm. color of your voice for this. Mm -hmm. But that is another time where I think you sometimes have that question of, do we follow this absolute historic precedent about which we know yeah. versus being more versatile? Yeah, and yeah. I wondered also, maybe Jesse could also speak to the taking on this uh, vocal line in part written for a different type of voice yeah. and finding your place in that. I just heard a mezzo sing across the street and it's just not the same. Uh, they did St. Matthew. It was just a very different timbre and a very different kind of voice. Yeah. The other thing is something common among my students over the years here at Colburn is to assume that the great composers, like somebody like Bach, wrote it exactly. Like, he was so good, he really didn't need your input and, in fact, published things exactly as he wanted. And I wondered, uh, particularly you, John, if you could speak about that tendency to think differently about Bach, mm -hmm. perhaps, yep, yep. <laughs> um, as, as somehow outside the, the margins of this world. Yes. So, yeah, thank well, you. Uh, great, great. Well, two, two questions there. I mean, the first one is about the type of singer. Um, what, what Bach almost certainly had at Leipzig was a, an unbroken boy uh, with a deep voice singing this. Um, how old would that boy have been? Well, from uh, what we know of the, the, the school rosters, that boy would have been probably somewhere between 17 and 21. So we're talking about a huge boy who is still to, <laughs> is still to, hit, is still hit, to hit puberty. So in a sense, he would have been actually quite close to what we would now call a castrato uh, because the voices broke so much later. So from that point of view, the instrument just does not exist. And unless you uh, feed boys, you know, just, just scraps, of, scraps of fat uh, and, and a couple of turnips uh, for, for 15 years, you will not get the same instrument. Um, so that, that's a, a good opportunity to think of, of what other types of voices we can use today. And obviously the female voice was used in Bach's time and indeed in some of his secular cantatas quite clearly. Um, so it, it's... Uh, well, it would be wrong to say it's the next best thing because it's the best thing we have. Uh, and sometimes, of course, we use countertenders as well, which is also a possibility in Bach's time, but not as broad a possibility as some perhaps might think. Uh, there is some evidence of falsetto singing in, in Bach's uh, time. So, um, so as I say, I, um, it, we're, we're talking about an instrument that doesn't exist. Uh, so therefore, uh, yeah, we, we, we have to synthesize something out of, uh, exactly as Jess said, out of what her natural singing is like, what she's learnt, but also how she fits in with the sonorities that an orchestra like this produces. Your second question was about Bach. Uh, does Bach sort of sit outside the normal historical mainstream because the notation is so perfect? And it is actually true, I think, that there's something incredibly robust about Bach's notated compositions, which means that if you have a consort of kazoos playing the Goldberg Variations, it actually still sounds good in a certain sense, not in every sense, but uh, the music is, is so hard to ruin. Uh, you have to get it completely wrong uh, well, handle if you get even slightly wrong and, and, and it can become very turgid if you, don't, if you can't charge it. But Bach's music does have this incredible tightness to it, which I think composers and musicians throughout the ages have, have really uh, cottoned onto. And he's, that's why he's become, I think, such a model uh, of perfection. And one could say that, yes, there is almost a performance there in the music already, just on the page. Uh, and it's true, I think, that, that Bach did write down things he'd heard. You can sort of see little gestures in his music and say, I bet he heard that at some point and then uh, integrated it into his music. So I think what we can do then is, as I was trying to say earlier, is relive something of that creative process. In other words, recharge the process of actually making this music just to get, get an extra edge on the quality of this music. As I say, it is hard to ruin uh, and hard to improve in a certain sense, but I think there is an idea that, that, that we, 
shouldn't forget Bach's own habits and um, instincts as a musician, as a, as a virtuoso improviser himself. So we want to get that side of Bach as well as this supremely structured, beautifully honed, notated music. So I hope that gives, gets us some of the way. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? Well, we considered that I actually have one of my own. Right. Yes. Um, just about, I, I remember that you mentioned in, in playing with history, um, and I think it's kind of a commonplace thing that at a certain point the historical performance movement had a sort of counterculture edge to it, a slightly subversive edge even maybe, with regard to mainstream classical music culture and its relationship to mainstream classical, what we might call mainstream classical music culture. I also, um, I suppose maybe this is more personal, have this ideal that historical performance on some level um, includes or is based upon constant rediscovery. Mm -hmm. So in other words, a reevaluation of sort of standard primary sources. Many of us in conservatory have to read, you know, Quantz, C.P. Bach, et cetera, but sort of a reevaluation of these sources. But it seems to me that one more recent thing that's happened with historical performance, and particularly, I guess, from the perspective of this side of the pond, um, is a sort of uh, institutionalization um, mm -hmm. that's happening. I kind of went to a relatively hippie uh, early music program at Oberlin back in the late 90s, mm. which is very different now that we have Juilliard, which used mm. to be this bastion of conservatism mm. in the mainstream, now has an incredibly successful um, historical performance program, which I believe is 10 years old now. I just wonder what, how you see the future of historical performance, specifically with regard to sort of this, this institutionalization as we yeah, become almost yeah. sort of more mainstream. Well, I think one, one, you, you put your finger on one thing there, which I think is very important, that, that saying that, you know, looking at sources, they, uh, in a certain sense, are always new because we bring new perspectives to them. So I think as long as people keep that inquiry and that sense of discovery going and don't assume that it's all been done, as it were, then we actually find new things. We have new priorities and so on. And from that point of view, I feel that the making of history and, uh, and the playing of history, the performing of history, is never exhausted. You're never going to do it. So, so I think that's the, that's the optimistic side of that thing. But as you say, yes, what was originally a countercultural movement can become itself quite conservative and quite uh, institutionalized. And that, that is a problem with institutions in general, of course, that institutions make things institutionalized. Um, and I think a lot of conservatories throughout the world, world and I've dealt, dealt with quite a few uh, in one way or another, are trying to address this issue by, by actually uh, broadening the uh, ways in which a student might engage with different types of historical repertory and giving them several perspectives simultaneously, rather than saying, you are definitely in the early music ghetto, you're definitely in the opera, opera studio and so on, uh, there, there is, I think, a move towards trying to encourage students to mix because nobody knows what the future is going to be in terms of the Western culture and, and other world cultures for that matter too. Uh, we have to be, as it were, adaptable and able to um, um, respond to circumstances that today we have no knowledge of, you know, and I think that is, that's the crucial thing, it, it, it's, it's doing, it, it's not letting things become ossified, because uh, ossified things almost always crumble and break at some point. Um, anybody, anybody else? I think then I would like to once again thank you for your absolutely stunning performances, for your fantastic lecture, and thank you so much for visiting us. Well, thank you for having us. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, stand over here.